Hello, and let's look at some statistical analysis, or at least an introduction to statistical analysis. For biology, these tools will be very useful when applied to experiments to help determine if your experimental results are meaningful or not, or if they just go along as expected, or if you've perhaps stumbled upon something new to help explain uh, your findings or your observations. So. Uh, here we go. Let's take a look at some of the terms that we need to know. Uh, first of all, what are error bars? Well, you're all used to drawing graphs and uh, plotting data. Error bars help us to represent how much the data varies. Okay, so we'll take a look at an example here. Um, the easiest way to th think of this is if you see something like, if you see a bar that looks like this with a line up here uh, that connects to a line down here. Um, you usually need a legend to help help to explain what these bars are, but it could be as simple as if this bar is the is representing the average of a certain number of values for group number one. If I'm using this data here, if this so the bar height was determined by the average, then this line up here could represent the maximum value in that group of numbers. So if I averaged ten numbers. If I average 10 numbers, this could be the highest number in that range. This could be the lowest number in that range. Or it could show something called the standard deviation, which we're going to learn about. Okay, The standard deviation is another way to represent the spread uh, of data. So let's go ahead and take a look at another example. So same thing, it could apply to line graphs as well too. And this is something that you'll try to apply uh, in all of your experiments in all the graphs that you're using to represent your experimental data. This guy says it's a really easy thing to include, so make sure to do it. All right. These error bars can go sideways as well, and the nice thing about error bars is that it helps you to visually see how a line or curve of best fit might go through that data. Um, Oftentimes you can just use Excel or use some kind of graphing software and it will calculate the best line of fit. But if you're doing this by hand, that's, which is still good practice to be able to see how this all goes, if you actually have the error bars in, then you can see that the majority of the, the area that's kind of trapped between the error bars, that's your general range for where your curve or line of best fit should go. So you can see this line of best fit is actually passing through the error bars, even if it's just barely. But it uh, gives us a good idea, especially with biology. Um, a lot of the experiments, the data varies. Biological systems are not as constant. For physics experiments, if we're following, if we're following general laws related to gravity or velocity, most of the times those experiments can generate um, very clear patterns. In biology, not so much, and so we'll see many more examples uh, in class. So think about applying error bars to everything. All right, this word, standard deviation, is very, very important to help you uh, describe what the spread of data. But a better way, let's just use an example. Here's Johnny, and here's Eugene. So just two students, and uh, Johnny takes 10 tests over the course of a year. These are his scores. You can see um, we, they're not really in any order here, so he didn't do so well on this one. He aces it a few times, 97, 99, 87, 67, not so good, maybe a D. This one definitely he failed. Uh, Eugene's scores look like this, 86, 87, uh, 87, 88. Anyways, all kind of in the range of 80s. But uh, if you calculate their average, it turns out that Johnny's average is 87% and Eugene's average is 88%. So if you're just looking at their averages and you were asked the question, who is the better student? It'd be kind of difficult to tell. You'd be just like, well, they're about the same, 87% and 88%. However, if you look at their individual scores, all 10 scores, their raw data, if you will, you can see that well, Johnny has peaked sometimes. Eugene's pretty, like, well, what are some words that you could use to describe his performance? You might say things like uh, consistent. Johnny's performance might be a little more erratic, but occasionally he does do very, very well. Uh, Eugene is a more consistent performer. But the whole idea here is, just by looking at their average scores, you can't 
really make a strong, a, a clear, you don't get the whole picture by just looking at their averages. So uh, here it is, Johnny scores an average of 87 from 10 different tests, Eugene scores an average of 88. So who is really the better student? Um, so another way to look at this is, well, who has the greater spread of scores? Now clearly, if the raw data is in front of you, you can see that Johnny clearly has the greater spread of scores. So what we can do is, besides just giving the average, we can give another number attached to the average that will give us a better idea of uh, their actual performance, and that is called the standard deviation. So let's see that what that actually looks like. So the standard deviation is designed to give us this additional information because uh, if you're looking, if I'm a, I am a teacher, so if I'm looking at all my student scores at the end, what do I, what do I submit to the online grading system for the school to send out report cards? I basically just put in their average. If someone asks, they can come back and look at the original scores and students will be very interested to know that. But does the average alone give a full picture? So think about that as well. And uh, when we're doing uh, statistics and biology to help with our experiments, oftentimes the average alone is not enough to help us determine if the, tr the leaves on that tree are really that much bigger than the leaves on this tree, or are boys on average really taller than girls, or is there not enough data to support that? So we're starting to use the standard deviation to help us explain some of these differences. So calculating the mean, or the average, you all know how to do that. If you have three numbers, you add them, uh, divide them by three, and then you get the average. The standard deviation, so this is the general formula for how to calculate the mean. The standard deviation, in order to calculate that, it looks very scary. So check this out. Mm, not something that I want to be doing every single day for every set of data. Luckily, your calculator will help you with this process. Uh, this is the formula for standard deviation right here. You see there's a couple little, uh, there's a that looks like an X bar, that's an average, here's a sum, so you're going to add up some things and then you're going to divide it, but uh, we'll go through how this is going to work with, with a calculator. But um, So how does this fit in? Let's say we actually did calculate the standard deviation for Johnny and Eugene. Um, we would write it as this. So we'd write down the average and then we put down plus or minus to represent a spread above and below the standard deviation. So let's see what that actually looks like. So for example, Johnny's test average, so I represent Johnny's test scores, his average is 87% and I say plus or minus 5%. What does that mean? Well that means his average is 87% and his standard deviation is 5% and we always do plus or minus. So that means 87 plus 5, which is 92, and 87 minus 5, which is 82, and that gives us an idea that most of his scores are between um, most of his scores are between 82 percent and 92 percent. Now this number right here, let's just ignore that for the moment. I'll explain that in a in a second here. But this is what this is how we interpret uh, these numbers that are written here. We say that the average is 87 percent with a standard deviation of five percent. And in plain English, that means well most of his scores are between 5% below 87 and 5% above. So that would be 82, which is 87 minus 5, and 92, which is 87 plus 5. Now, in plain English, I, I use the word most. And uh, statistically speaking, most means 68%. So try to wrap your head around this. Pause the video if you need to think about this for a second. We'll see this in many different examples in class and graphically as well. So when I see these numbers here, what I'm saying is, out of all of Johnny's tests, roughly two-thirds, or 68% of all his tests, all of his test scores were between 82 and 92. Then I can go one step further. So this is one standard deviation above and below. So five represents one standard deviation above and below. I can go one step further, and I can say, well, what if I plus five and plus another five? Or what if I go 87 minus five and minus another five? Well, I end up with this situation. 95, uh, 87 plus 5 plus 5 becomes 97. 87 minus 5 minus 5, if I go two steps below, becomes 77. Now what I can say is not just most, but almost all 
of Johnny's scores are in between 77% and 97%. So if you go back and you think about Johnny's scores, his big spread of data, um, you can end up making a conclusion like that. So in plain English, we'd say most of his scores are one standard deviation around the mean. And we could say here that almost all of Johnny's scores are two standard deviations around the mean, two steps below or two steps above. Okay, here's another way to see this uh, graphically, so go ahead, pause the video, just take a look at this and try to study it, and then we'll come back and look at it with a few other examples. All right.